that means that we can go ahead and get people started on saying hello in chat. So can you go to the next slide? So we'll be waiting for a few other people to join over the next few minutes. And while we do so, this will be a familiar activity for those who have been on these calls before. Just please take a moment to pop into the chat window and say hello and share anything about where you're joining from today, anything you want to share about ROAR, and uh, anything else that is relevant. So we'll spend a few minutes doing that while we wait for a few others to join. Hello, everyone who's just joining. We're taking a moment to do some hellos and introductions in the chat, so you can head on over there when you get a chance. I was... Nick, I just saw your message in there and I was having that same thought when I have to introduce you in the agenda. So I don't know if I will, I don't know if I will win the bonus points, but I will try. All right, great to see people joining from all over the place today. We'll get started in about a minute. Right, so feel free to keep on saying hello and introducing yourselves in chat. I think we will go ahead and get started with the official kickoff of today's meeting. For those of you I may not have had a chance to meet yet, my name is Maria Gould and I am the director of ROAR. Very happy to be welcoming you all to this call today. This will be the final community call of 2023. We know that some of you here have been to many of calls over the past year and years before, and some of you are newer, so all are welcome. We're really happy that you're making time to join us today. If you are just Getting on Zoom right now, we are just getting started. You can take a moment to say hello and introduce yourself in chat if you would like. So the plan for today's call is we have a few quick updates and announcements that we wanted to share. Then we are going to share a couple of updates on the technical front and on our curation activities and then Amanda will give everyone an update on the state of ROAR adoption at this point in the year, and that will lead us into three very exciting featured integrations with three very exciting guest speakers today representing Caltech and University of Groningen, I'm not sure I pronounced that correctly, and Science Open. And depending on how much time we have at the end, we like to do open Q&A and we always stick around a little bit on Zoom after the hour is over in case anybody wants to ask anything on a more uh, informal basis. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. I have a couple of quick housekeeping items that I wanted to mention about these calls, especially if you are newer. We hold these community calls every other month and they're a great opportunity for those of us on the ROAR team to share updates and new developments, to ask for your feedback and input, and also to offer space for community members to share what they are working on and how they are integrating ROAR. So that's a quick plug. If you would ever like to share something at a future call, please get in touch and we'd love to hand the mic over to you. 
we announce all of these calls in various places, including our primary community mailing list. Amanda will make sure that you are on it if you are not already. And we have a running page on the ROAR website where we list all of the various events that we are involved in, including these calls, but also conferences and webinars and other types of sessions. Uh, even if you're not on the mailing list and if you're newer, uh, that's totally fine. These calls are open to anyone. Feel free to pass on the word to your colleagues and anyone else who you think might be interested in joining. It's great to have people coming every other month. It's also fine if you can only drop in from time to time. We really just want to make sure that we have this regular time and space to offer information to the community and also hear what you are working on and what is on your mind. So to that end, we really encourage these calls to be informal and participatory. Please continue to, to chat away in the chat box, raise your hand, unmute if you wanna say anything. We really wanna make sure that everyone has a chance to be included and, and represented and have a chance to speak up if they wanna talk about anything. We do record these calls and we have been putting the recordings on the ROAR YouTube channel for those who are not able to join at this particular time. And we also will send a follow-up email with a link to the recording after. So uh, that is my uh, list of housekeeping items related to these calls. And on the next slide, I'll just mention a few other ways that you can be involved if you are not already outside of these bi-monthly calls. Uh, and those include submitting feedback uh, on various kinds of features or bugs in our GitHub repository. Um, also submitting feedback on registry curation activities, uh, feedback on additions or changes to the registry. That's a great way that we like to engage everyone across the community. Can we just move on to the next slide so I can remember what else I put on here? Uh, we have various discussion channels. Um, we, I see some mention in the chat right now about our Slack space. We also have a tech support forum. We'll make sure to drop these links into the chat. And those are great ways for people to ask questions and interact uh, in between these bi-monthly calls. Uh, we've also been featuring various case studies on the ROAR blog, and so um, that's another great way for community members to share what they're working on with the broader world. So if you're working on something or planning to uh, work on something, let us know, and it would be great to feature it on the ROAR blog or in one of these calls. And in general, we just always like to know what people are doing and thinking. So... Those are the all of the housekeeping items. And now I'll just move into a few quick announcements and updates. Let's go to the next slide. So one exciting thing that is coming up at the end of January is that Roar is celebrating its fifth birthday or anniversary or whatever kind of milestone we want to associate it with it. Roar uh, was launched in January 2019 at Pitapalooza in Dublin. The image that you're seeing on the slide is one of the sessions where we introduced Roar to the community for the very first time. And we got everyone in the roaring spirit by decorating their own paper lion masks. I believe that some people on the call right now are depicted in the photo, but I will leave it to them to uh, to reveal themselves um, should they wish to do so. Uh, so at every year since that launch, uh, we have been celebrating Roar's anniversary at the end of January and using it as an opportunity to reflect on the past year and also look ahead to the following year and engage the community in giving input on future directions and other kinds of topics. So this coming year is no different, except we want to make the party even bigger because five years is a really exciting milestone. We wouldn't be reaching this milestone without the support engagement of all of you and everyone else who has been supporting ROAR and championing ROAR over the years. So this will be a really exciting milestone for everyone to celebrate and in to that end, we will be celebrating across five different 
sessions. They will all be on Zoom. We're um, not doing an in-person event this year, but we hope that by doing these sessions on Zoom, it will give everyone everywhere a chance to participate. So uh, their links are going to be available on the ROAR events page for you to sign up. We are still finalizing a lot of specifics, but for now, I just wanted to encourage everyone to save those dates, uh, sign up, so you have those links and, and events marked on your calendar, and we'll share a lot more details closer to the date. I will just put in a quick plug that the sessions will be a combination of sharing updates from ROAR, reflecting on, on the past and looking ahead to the future, also offering space for community demos and examples of different ways in which people are integrating ROAR. And we're also going to be convening a topical panel on ROAR and funding information, which has been a big, a big theme of the past year and will continue to be in the year ahead. So we're really excited to convene a group of experts to talk about that. So that's my plug for the fifth anniversary. Stay tuned for more information. And for now, please save the dates. And I just wanted to mention that those registration links are in fact available on our Wonderful. events page today. So you can go ahead there and check them out. Excellent. Thank you so much. All right, so next slide, the other quick community update and announcement is just a note of gratitude to the organizations that are continuing to support ROAR. For those of you who may be less familiar with how ROAR is structured and supported, we are operated as a collaborative initiative by three organizations, California Digital Library, Crossref, and Datasite. And those organizations are committed to supporting ROAR's core expenses over the long term as part of their operating budgets and with the support of their boards and executive leadership. And that is really the foundation upon which we have helped ROAR to become sustainable and stable. We also have a supporters program by which organizations interested in supporting ROAR's growth and innovation are able to contribute funds to do so. Uh, for the past year, we have been participating in the SCOS fundraising campaign to encourage investments in open infrastructure. And a lot of the contributions we've had over the past year have come through SCOS, but that's not the only channel through which organizations have chosen to contribute. So I just wanted to, to highlight the, the latest organizations that have stepped up to contribute to ROAR and to mention our sincere gratitude. Uh, some of these as well are repeat supporters who continue to support ROAR year on year, and that means a great deal to us. So thank you very much. All right, so that concludes the housekeeping and general updates and announcements. And now I'm going to pretend to be our technical lead for a moment. Uh, Liz Krasnarich is not able to join the call today. So I'm stepping in in her place just to give a couple of brief updates on the technical front. So those of you who have been joining these calls or been on our mailing list over the past year, and change are will be familiar with the development work that has been underway to release a new version of the ROAR schema and API. And many of you contributed feedback on the new schema, for which we are very grateful. So the exciting news is that we had uh, a period of time for beta testing the V2. That period is complete. We really appreciate everyone who contributed feedback and was a, who was able to test. And if you didn't get a chance to play around with V2, it's still available in our dev API environment. So you're welcome to take a look and also share any thoughts or questions that you have. There's a lot of documentation about the V2 schema on our README site. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail right now about all of the specifics about what's changing because we've covered that in previous calls. But if you want to get caught up, the README site is the best place to do that. 
We also have a version, a V2 version of the data dump available for testing in addition to the API. Just a quick note uh, that we are only making that data dump available in GitHub right now and not in, in Zenodo. Uh, Zenodo went through a significant but also very exciting upgrade this fall um, on the Invenio RDM platform, and that caused some changes to the handling of the ROAR data dump in the Zenodo sandbox. So long story short, if you are interested in testing the V2 data dump, please grab it from GitHub. This should all be documented in the README site and get in touch if you have any questions. Next slide. So you might be wondering when is V2 going to launch? We are still expecting the public release to be happening in the first quarter of 2024. We will share more details about the timing as we know them. I expect we'll have some more specifics to share around the time of the fifth anniversary celebration. And a quick reminder, if you weren't part of previous conversations, V1, is not going away right away. It will remain available through at least the first quarter of 2025. So it is not uh, uh, not imperative that anybody switch right away, but now is a good time to start thinking and, and planning about making a switch at some point um, next year. So uh, just another quick note um, about the Zenodo changes. Uh, there have been some changes to the programmatic downloading of the data dump from Zenodo as a result of the upgrade I mentioned previously. So uh, we know some people have experienced some issues with the requests that they had set up to pull the data dump from Zenodo. We've updated all of the documentation about that on the ROAR README site. And again, if you run into any issues or have any questions, we are always more than happy to help. So let us know. So with that, I will hand it over to Adam. Thanks, Maria. Hi, everyone. Adam Buttrick, I'm a data curation lead for ROAR, here to provide a few quick updates on ROAR curation. Uh, first up, uh, curation request volume is up, up, up <laughs> across the board with us averaging between four to 500 requests per month. Might even be a little bit more than that in November. Um, we have additional demand driven from a number of sources, the OSTP memo here in the United States, uh, ROAR becoming the primary institutional ID in ORCID, various regional initiatives, as well as all the great services that are now building on top of the registry, including the ones we'll hear about today. But, and it's really great to have a caveat here. Um, as a result of all the generous community support we've received that Maria talked about at the top of the hour, we also have some new contract staff helping us to expedite curation requests. So a bit of a heartfelt personal thanks to me, to all our supporters for making this possible. Uh, in terms of project work, both in progress and that we've published since our last meeting, uh, we've continued our work on the funder registry reconciliation, reaching about 94% assertion coverage in Crossref and 97% coverage in data site as we approach the year's end. We published two deep dive blogs about this work that came out back in September, October, um, as well as an open source project monitoring app. So check that all out if you haven't had a chance, org slash blog. Um, for the U.S. government, we completed curation projects from the Department of Energy, which I know Carly's here, uh, and the National Oceanic uh, and Atmospheric Administration. I think Jennifer is here as well. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Carly. Uh, and we're in progress with the Department of Defense. Uh, thanks very much to their staff for all the work they put into making these a success. Uh, we've seen increased engagement from U.S. government agencies, departments, and now contractors as well across the board. So we expect this coverage and quality to further increase in 2024. Uh, back in August, we published a large update for French research units with the assistance of the Ministry of Higher Education and Research in France. I know Xiaoping is here too. Hi, Xiaoping. Uh, using data from their national level registry, RSR. Um, after this release, Xiaoping specifically uh, provided us with some additional feedback, which we used to update another few hundred records in October. Um, this work on research units is driving up demand from France in general and will um, continue into 2024. So we really appreciate their partnership in helping us to meet it. Uh, last but certainly not least, we've got two large in-progress projects from the Spanish National Research Council and Spanish Foundation for Science and Technology. Uh, both have submitted wide-ranging reviews of the country's research organizations. Uh, we began publishing corresponding records for these this month and will continue into the new year. This should improve both quality and coverage for records in Spain, so we thank them for their support in helping us to improve the registry. 
Great. That's all for me. Thanks to everyone for your continued engagement with Curating Roar. I look forward to all the new and exciting metadata adventures we'll have together in 2024. Thank you so much for those updates, Adam. Uh, great to hear about, about all of that. And we know that you um, put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into making all the Roar records uh, accurate, adding new ones uh, at, a, at an enviable pace. So we appreciate that. All right, so I'm here to uh, give you some updates on Roar adoption. One of the more recent things, this just came out a, a few days ago, which I was very glad to hear about um, was that Roar is going to be integrated into the core functionality of PKP's open journal systems, also known as OJS, which as most of you I'm sure know, is a very widely used open source publishing system. And um, we did hear, um, I think a couple of calls ago from Alex Smacker, who's the lead developer at PKP. And he was talking about in the current version 3.4, how Roar is used very much behind the scenes to manage institutional subscriptions and general sort of institution models that are mostly used for journal statistics in OJS. However, um, as of 3.2, there has been a Roar plugin for OJS, uh, which has enabled people to use Roar in both OJS and OPS, uh, but that plugin has not had the ability to send Roar IDs in affiliations to uh, in DOI registrations. And so it's really, really great news that they're going to sort of integrate, move that from a plugin architecture into the core uh, code base of OJS. So that's great news. Um, I'm also going to show you here, this is not um, a new adoption per se, uh, but back in early November, uh, Roar and ORCID collaborated on a couple of webinars. Um, really one webinar with sort of two instances uh, for different time zones about affiliations in ORCID. Um, so the recordings for those are available um, via ORCID. I've linked to them as well in these slides, which will be of course available after the call. Um, and I wanted to show you with ORCID's permission, a couple of interesting slides that they shared uh, showing statistics about war in ORCID. So this was one that they showed, which is, um, affiliations in general in ORCID over time. Uh, one of the key things you can see is that, of course, um, you know, affiliations of all kinds. Uh, this is per year. Every single bar is, uh, you know, measuring uh, measuring that uh, affiliations over time. And then the colors are what types of affiliations they are. And I always think this is really interesting because when we talk about Roar being used for affiliations, I at least tend to associate that with that with what organization is this author uh, employed by? Is this researcher employed by? But you can see that employment affiliations are really only part of the number of affiliations in ORCID. Uh, of course, in ORCID records, people are using organization identifiers, including ROAR for uh, education affiliations. Um, and then particular distinctions, qualifications, memberships, um, you know, something like, um, you know, for a long time, I have been a, a member of the Modern Language Association since I have a degree in English. Um, that is in my ORCID. We have a Roar ID for that. So, you know, what kinds of organizations are you a member of, scholarly associations that can all be managed by Roar IDs. Um, and so this is just sort of, you know, in general, more and more types of affiliations being added to, to ORCID over time, which I think is interesting. And then here we have a breakdown of which identifiers are being used for those affiliations. Um, so the orange bars uh, at, the, at the bottom of these, of these bars in this bar graph just represent affiliations in general, um, which are not marked by IDs. Um, ROAR is teal, our, our signature brand color of teal. And of course, ORCID only did the ROAR integration in 2021, more or less, which is why uh, that begins there. Um, over time, you can see that Ringgold, which is the sort of yellow, um, has decreased quite a bit, uh, and especially in, in 2023, now that Roar is the default identifier in ORCID. And then you can see there are quite a bit of FundRef affiliations as well, but honestly, not as many as I would have thought. Um, grid affiliations are still there, but uh, very many fewer of those. Um, so quite an interesting little graph. 
Here are some more graphs. Um, I show this one uh, every couple of months, and this is a line trending upward, um, showing ROAR IDs used in Crossref records, specifically for contributor affiliations, or in some cases, uh, principal investigator affiliations, if the content type is a graph. Um, those of you who have been on these calls before will know that that little spike back in August of 2022 indicates a single uh, organization's adoption of ROAR. Uh, Europe PMC did a wonderful ROAR integration um, where they were adding ROAR IDs to welcome grants and submitting those to Crossref. So we've uh, now broken the 75,000 mark of ROAR IDs in Crossref data, which is great. Uh, similarly, here are ROAR IDs in data site uh, records. And now data site uh, adopted ROAR um, quite a bit earlier than Crossref did. And similarly, this was a spike that we talked about um, on the September community call which is a database called strain info added uh, nearly 300,000 records to data site, all of which were marked with ROAR IDs, which was great. So that's now um, approaching 1.2 million records in data site uh, with ROAR IDs used for affiliations. Here are a couple of new graphs that I did. Um, the data site API lets you uh, see what kinds of identifiers are being used as well, which is always quite interesting. So for affiliations, ROAR is overwhelmingly the identifier of choice. Um, there are still a few people hanging on to grid. Um, we should probably uh, get in touch with those people and ask them, hey, you know, you might want to switch over to ROAR. That's very easy. We have scripts that can help you match those grid IDs to ROAR IDs. Uh, and then you can maybe see a very thin little red line, which is 0.1% of ISNI IDs being used to uh, identify affiliations in data site records. Um, similarly, um, as Maria mentioned, the big theme of the last year has been ROAR IDs to identify funders. And in data site records, of course, the Crossref funder registry is the main identifier that's used to identify funders in records. So that's about 65%. But we're, we're nearing um, sort of the halfway mark uh, for ROAR. Uh, ROAR is definitely um, increasingly used for funders. And I think we're going to only see the little teal uh, slice of this donut expand. Um, so it's already quite a significant proportion of data site records that are using ROAR IDs to identify funders, and then still a few for GRID, and then um, it's about 2.1% ISNI. I just wanted to mention a couple of recent blog posts. We did a case study interview quite recently with Adam Day of Clear Skies, um, who he's the uh, that is an organization that produces a product called Paper Mill Alarm, which is uh, been profiled in nature and in other things. And it's one of the things it does is helps detect fraudulent activity in research um, by analyzing thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, research items. Uh, they can detect signals for where there might be fraudulent activity um, or in some cases just research misconduct of uh, several different kinds. So we did a little interview with him that's on the ROAR blog. He's very much um, in favor of ROAR as an open data set. He was also very um, uh, pleased that ROAR is uh, uh, mapped to latitude and longitude and has uh, other sort of geolocation information in it, which I think is maybe a feature of ROAR we don't emphasize enough. Um, as Adam mentioned, uh, this blog post too uh, is a, a nice detailed analysis of how ROAR and the Open Funder Registry overlap. So you can really dig deep into the data about that uh, you know, how ROAR um, is, there are matching ROAR IDs for over 94% of assertions in Crossref, funding assertions in Crossref. Uh, so if you're interested in more, uh, please read that. And then um, forthcoming is a case study with Cameron Nealon, um, whom many of you probably know from the Koki Open Access Dashboard, which is a great tool. Okay, um, with that, uh, we're going to move on to some featured presenters, and I will uh, run the slides for this. Um, first up, we have Tom Morell from Caltech. Tom, take it away. Thanks, thanks, Amanda. Let's get started with uh, with my my slides. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you today about some uh, repository modernization we've been doing at Caltech Library, and these are our two largest institutional repositories. We have Caltech Data, which is for data sets and software that are generated at Caltech. It's got about 72,000 records. Most of those were kind of automatically added. We got some 
big collections that we migrated from other systems. It's been an Invenio-based repository from the start, and it migrated to Invenio RDM, which is, uh, as Amanda mentioned earlier in the call, uh, what Zenodo uses. Uh, currently, um, we migrated to that early. We were an early adopter in September of 2022. Um, we also have our Celtic Authors Repository. So that is our repository for all of the publications and reports that have been created at Caltech. Um, so it has over 100,000 records, it is continually growing. And this is a really long running, rich resource. So it's been around since 2004 and it was an ePrints repository. Um, we have been able to migrate that to Invenio RDM um, in August. And it's been, it's been a big project. Um, and, but both of these have a lot to do with, with Roar. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we've used Roar um, in both these repository systems. Get the next slide, please. So uh, one of the things that's really fun about Nvidia RDM is it's, uh, it has Roar as kind of a base assumption. So it just assumes that when we're talking about affiliations, we're gonna be identifying those with a Roar. And when we're talking about funders, that those are gonna be identified with a Roar. Um, and Amanda actually did a case study of our Roar use in Caltech data, and I've linked it there. Um, so everything that I'm gonna talk about today is all new and exciting. So that's, that's, that's the goal is I wanna share some new stuff mostly how we've been using uh, for in Celtic authors, but a lot of the stuff we de deploy on both repositories. And get the next slide. Okay, so uh, Roar is built into the deposit form in, in Vineyardium um, for affiliations. So what we've done for, uh, for both our repositories is we have a list of Celtic people. So basically the uh, controlled vocabulary of people that we care about who are associated with Caltech. And then you can basically start to autocomplete their name um, it will find the person you're interested in. When you click on it, it will auto fill in their ORCID if we have it and their affiliation. And the affiliation on the back end, it doesn't show up in this interface, um, is VOR. And these are all, this is, this is an easy mapping, right? They're all Caltech people. So we, all, we know they all get Caltech affiliations. Uh, we can add additional affiliations and those work with an autocomplete. So affili our affiliations vocabulary is kind of the, the easy use case of we have Caltech people, we tag them with the Caltech VOR, and that makes it through the system. Uh, I can get the next slide. So what we, we have a similar thing for funders. So from our um, grants office, we've been able to get a report of all of the Caltech awards from federal funders. Then we go ahead and we can map those federal funders to VORs. I've linked to the script there if you wanna see the, the, the nitty gritty of what that mapping looks like. And then we can load that vocabulary into Invenior RDM. And so then all the funders here are identified by war. So if you look at the, the drop down on that right hand side, you see our, our biggest funder is NASA in terms of number of awards. We don't, there's no money amounts in here. And then National Science Foundation, National Institute of Health. So basically we're identifying all those funders and cleaning up the metadata that comes out of our funding system, which is a mess, um, into nice clean roars. So as far as the, the repository knows, it knows things, it knows the funders as roars. You can also do a full text search in the search bar and search by award title or our account number or the award number. And those are all also tied to the VOR for, for the funding value. So that's how people can manually add, add VORs into their records. But we also have a lot of automation, which I wanted to talk about on the next slide. So the first bit of automation we've been able to implement is harvesting from Crossref based on VOR. So because Caltech Authors is an institutional repository, we wanna get basically everything published by uh, people affiliated with Caltech. And the VOR is a really nice way to, to do that. So we can basically say, there's a query for Crossref to say, please give me all the publications where this VOR is, where the Caltech VOR has been mentioned. We can then harvest those, process the metadata and put them into our queue. This is just a bunch of, uh, records that we've been able to find automatically from Crossref and add to, into our review buffer. So our librarians take a look at them then approve them and can make them available in the repository. Um, and we've got this up also on GitHub as a little, a little harvester GitHub action bot. Um, so this makes it really easy for us to keep our repository in check. When the publishers use the ROARs for the affiliations, we get the content automatically. Um, next slide, I'll talk about what those records look like when they come in. 
So roars pass through Crossref. So when the publisher is using the roar, this is an example record where we've got both Caltech and Penn State uh, author affiliations. So when the publisher makes that data available, when it comes into our system, it then tags the authors with the correct affiliations. So NVIDIA RDM uh, numbers those automatically. And then when it has a roar in the, the landing page, it'll show it in this little drop down that says, yes, you know, it's, it's Pennsylvania State University and we have a roar for it. Um, so that's really nice. We automatically get the correct affiliations um, without us having to do any typing or matching or anything like that. So when the publishers provide data, we get it and it shows up in the system very nicely. We also do a similar thing for funders. If you go to the next slide. Since Crossref is using Crossref funder IDs for those, we basically have implement, implemented the mapping. So when we get a Crossref funder ID, we get the Roar API to figure out what the Roar is. And then we use that to identify what the funders are. Uh, in this example, we've got three different funders. Um, again, we don't, the, the interface here doesn't show the Roar, but on the back end, if you look at the metadata, California Institute of Technology, the Jet Propulsion Lab, DARPA are all identified by the Roar. So basically, when that, med that metadata is available in Crossref, we can automatically pull it in, and then we get really nice, clean information about what, what organizations funded a given work. Um, on my last slide, I just wrap up some things that we are still working on. Um, so we need to improve the display and search of funders. So for that autocomplete, you know, we need to have kind of more country information um, when we're manually adding an award that's not already in the system to make sure that people are picking the right funder. We have, you know, about 100,000 records uh, where we don't have ROARs because they were in ePrints. So we need to do uh, a whole bunch of cleanup work and figuring out how we're going to approach that. And we also need to better handle uh, departments and name variations and affiliations. So at the moment, uh, you know, it'll pull in the ROAR name, but we want to be able to kind of cleanly say, you know, when somebody puts in something different in that affiliation field, how we can both show the affiliation that they typed in as well as have the ROAR linked. So those are things we're going to be working on uh, in the next year. Thanks. That's amazing. Thanks so much, Tom. Um, I am going to go ahead and uh, pass things off to the other two integrators. Uh, remember your questions, write them down. We should have plenty of time for Q&A at the end, but I do want to make sure we give everybody uh, enough time to present their integrations. I have many questions I want to ask you, Tom. <laughs> so great. All right. Um, next, we have Nick Veenstra, who's speaking to us uh, about uh, his use of Roar at the University of Groningen. Yes, yeah, so well, thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm from University of Groningen and I work there as a, a research information specialist, primarily surrounding uh, Pure. And we are doing a, a business intelligence project on our research information and uh, Pure is mainly our integrator for all this information. So it's our, what we in Europe call the CRIS system, current research information system, and we want to do a lot of integrations. And uh, we are running into some um, data curation problems within uh, the system. Um, uh, so, and most Dutch universities use uh, Pure, um, and we mainly import from Scopus, Web of Science, and PubMed. And the problem is that it's getting a bit out of hand in terms of curation because um, the data model um, is a bit lacking, I think, in the sense that it has a kind of uh, typical issues. And one of them is that um, the system distinguishes between external and internal organizations. And so the internal organizations being your own university and uh, uh, faculties and stuff like that. And then you have all the um, other external organizations that uh, people collaborate with or funders or whatever. And that's, that's a very light uh, data model in Pure. So we don't have a lot of space to enrich those organizations. So I'm advocating uh, moving on to a single uh, organization data type in Pure with a property of it being internal or external, but I have a hard time of convincing the Elsevier people about that. Um, another, the, the problem that stems from that is the fact that the import logic isn't really uh, able to handle um, the, all those affiliations. Uh, uh, researchers are uh, required to um, Im import all their uh, publications into Pure. And generally, the uh, external organizations, as they are then called, aren't really mapped well and, and uh, unified. And that results in the fact that here at Groningen, we now have a list of 215,000 organizations that 
we apparently are collaborating with and we estimate that if we clean that up it should only be like 10 to 20 percent of that so it's a bit of a, a mess and we can't clean it up by hand anymore and then you ask Elsevier can you do something about it and they uh, will do it for a fee and uh, so I, I won't disclose the fee but I can do it a lot cheaper myself I think so um, and the interesting thing is that we've like pushed them uh, for a few years to come up with a new API so an API that's able to write into the system and we have that now so that enables us to uh, uh, directly also write into the organization database and start fixing and cleaning up the organizations uh, ourselves and for that we want to use Aurora as the primary organization ID where it's now there the Elsevier Scopus ID which isn't a good uh, identifier to to base our work uh, on next slide please so the main thing here is that we need a vendor uh, independent identifier. So Elsevier uh, slash Pure is very dominant. I think there's only one or two universities left who do not use uh, Pure. Um, and we want to limit that uh, dependency because as I mentioned, we have a, uh, um, uh, sorry. So uh, Pure only loads the Scopus organizations IDs and they place that at the at external organizations. but. Um, so we're building a BI data warehouse with our research in it, um, and we don't want to be dependent on Elsevier specific identifiers, because in a few years we might switch to another Chris system, and then we would have to redo the whole data warehouse with other identifiers, so we want to make it right from the start and use an open identifier in the same way as we would like to use ORCID as uh, uh, personal identifiers and not Scopus uh, ID. So we uh, um, we are working on that. Um, and I also, so I've been looking into uh, 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 doing uh, the integration of uh, ROAR into our systems. Um, and I noticed that um, we, uh, that if you, once you load in ROARs, you can also uh, use the ROAR link to Wikidata and even enrich the, the organizations uh, more. And that would definitely help in our visualization of the whole network of research uh, further than just uh, basic uh, the uh, the uh, um, uh, identifiers. Um, so we did an, um, uh, a, a quick test of uh, how far we could get. And I started with uh, OpenLX um, because I noticed that OpenLX has a lot of raw uh, identifiers in their database. Um, and so I got to the point where I could already uh, map 58% of the so-called external organizations in Pure um, uh, to a, a raw ID, and that would already enable us to like automatically clean up the whole database and use uh, raw as the primary uh, identifier. And at some point, uh, I want to I I did a quick look at at um, Crossref, but I wasn't able to find a lot of um, uh, raw IDs there. But from the previous slides, I saw that uh, um, it's getting it's uh, being um, improved. So I'll, I'll definitely have a look at that uh, uh, as well. But yeah, there will always be a small portion that we need to do by hand and and do duplicate deduplication in in uh, in pure uh, manually. Okay, next slide, please. So. Um, uh, we're looking at how to approach this because every pure instance in the Netherlands has the same problem. They all have th hundreds of thousands of organizations that they need to clean up. Um, and uh, I already wrote some code to do that in our local database. So we could basically do it for all the Dutch uh, installations. Um, but then we'd also need to keep that up because uh, Pure doesn't uh, allow us to set another primary identifier and use that during import. Um, so we need to like clean up uh, regularly to keep our database uh, clean. Um, and we need to collaborate on that in the Netherlands. And also we would have to look at uh, specific Dutch organizations to see if we need any uh, also um, um, to supply those uh, um, organizations uh, to you to enter into the database. Um, and so I'm interested also to know if there's, we were thinking about maybe having a kind of uh, Dutch representation for our pure customers to help clean up their database and then also add new uh, organizations that are specific to the Netherlands. So I was wondering if there were any kind of 
examples of that in other countries in the world that we could uh, could learn from. Um, and also, but what I forgot to mention, but but I was inspired by the previous slides on funder information. Um, we also uh, are talking with our national funder NWO and and some others to try to uh, implement ROAR. But it's like their technical expertise is very low key, if I say this carefully. Um, so they uh, have a hard time of implementing it. Uh, we, we've been begging them for like a proper ORCID integration and that's already uh, quite complex and, and then they already see me coming with another identifier that I want in their database and they're not uh, happy about that uh, I guess but we I, I, I'm we're trying to convince them that we need open identifiers instead of of uh, vendor specific ones so yeah that's kind of thing we are looking at at the moment I think that was last slide so yeah uh Yes, sorry, I was trying to unmute. No, thank you very much. That's really interesting. And again, I have a number of questions for you. I think um, you may have some conversations to be having with Adam about national curation efforts. One thing I will mention is that I know that NWO, as you probably know as well, has just become a Crossref member, and I believe is participating in the Crossref uh, funder advisory group, um, which is very much um, encouraging the use of open identifiers to identify funders and for other purposes. So yes. Okay. All right. And then our last uh, and third featured integration, we're going to hear from Nina Sheke from Science Open, who has a few slides, and then I'm going to pass over screen sharing to her so she can do a live demo of Roar in Science Open. Nina? Okay. Yeah, super. Thank you. Okay. So I'm just a quick second. Okay, so um, we are very happy here today to just show our integration of RAW. And before we start, I would like, just like to say very few introductory words to us. We are Science Open. We are a freely accessible discovery and networking platform containing currently over 90 million records. We are constantly upgrading our system and database and support a variety of different content types. So that meanwhile, we do not only have article records, but also books and chapters almost a million, million proceedings, furthermore reports, posters, and data sets. For our users, we offer a variety of services, especially for authors and researchers, all for free, such as a range of features for author self-promotion or free open access poster preprint publication. And of course, we have many different solutions for publishers as well, ranging from book and journal discovery to open access hosting or publication and uh, copy edit workflows. And we also launched a new platform um, in full this year, the Book Meta Hub, which is an independent free to use meta data hub for scientific publishers to create and or enhance book metadata to produce metadata for books for indexing purposes, specifically in digital environments. So please, yeah, thank you. Uh, and as of this year, February, we have implemented RAW in our system and rolled out support uh, platform-wide as part of the avail uh, available affiliations data. So this means that on all records within our database, we are reading out the RAW IDs as an integral part of the author inf um, information, if available, of course. And we have also integrated raw IDs within all of our manuscript submission systems and enhancement interfaces, both on Science Open and Book Meta Hub. And here you see a little screenshot of the raw data within the affiliation wrapper outputted in the metadata records, because, um, for example, on the Book Meta Hub, you can, of course, export or query uh, the data as well. <clears throat> Uh, the input is very easy and intuitive. I will show that in a second via an unstructured plain field form field for affiliations. You can make a simple lookup and match for respective raw IDs. And the system works exactly the same for our funder IDs too, as part of the funding data. The open funder registry was already rolled out last year in June. Uh, next slide, please. Here you see a very simple preview from an indexed record uh, on Science Open. So this is a simple readout example, which is a nice, uh, rather rich uh, metadata record from Nature Medicine coming to us um, via PMC. 
Um, and here you can see, of course, the raw ID is added to the author's affiliations and also the author details with the ORCID. Next slide, please. Uh, this preview is taken from our book MetaHub. So you see here um, the interface for a book published by Radbau University, uh, who are using the book MetaHub for the record creation. And in the background here, you see the interface that you can use or publishers use for metadata curation. Here, um, specifically the author details with the affiliation. You also see this plain form field text, um, which of course can be simply uh, inputted by copy paste. So as I mentioned, this is unstructured. You can just copy paste it and insert it here. And then either the authors um, themselves, depending on the, um, from where you access this, either the authors um, themselves as part of their manuscript submission, or in this example here, the editors can update the affiliation with a raw ID by simply clicking this little button that you see, add raw ID, and the system then will return <coughs> The return, sorry, <clears throat> the system will then return all possible matches. So, uh, as I mentioned, I will showcase this in a second. So, you don't need to um, research any IDs in advance, but you can just apply the raw ID by clicking the button. So, and then now, as a very last step, um, as Amanda already mentioned, I will showcase you um, this um, the implementation live. Here from an example um, in our in the African mine uh, Africa archive preprint uh, server, where the authors did not input the raw ID as part of their affiliation in the submission. So either the uh, here in this example, either the um, authors can update their own record or the editors can enhance this and input this raw ID as part of an editorial control. So and now I'm gonna just try to very quickly and smoothly share my screen, <laughs> I hope. So, okay, works, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Right? So, also, here, either I'm, I'm the author, I submitted this, then I can enhance my own record, or I am the editor within a certain collection framework, and then I can also enhance the metadata. So with this um, permission, I can I can find here an edit button. This is the record. So it's a it's a preprint PDF metadata is inputted. Um, the full text is available in a PDF. I can edit this metadata by simply clicking this button, and the user face opens. The user face is basically pretty much the same everywhere, be it a submission system, um, be it an enhancement interface. Of course, there could be slight differences, but the overall uh, functionalities are the same. So, and as you he uh, see, I scroll down here, the author information is inputted. We have the affiliation, the complete affiliation as it was inputted or copy pasted. And now I'll just do this. I click this raw, add a raw ID button here. And I have here the first um, result returned is in Bosch University. Obviously here, this is the right raw ID. I click it nice. and it's added. And the same, I do this for the same here, Leiden University, first result, Leiden University. I have, by the way, I have editorial permission to do that. <laughs> so I'm gonna save this now. Um, yeah, so this is now an actual update on the live site. And we have now, if you scroll down, we have now the affiliation enriched with a raw ID. Simple as that. That's it. That was our implementation. Very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I genuinely find that uh, very impressive. Yes. Uh, uh, I will give this uh, to our dev team. Yes, yes, yes. Um, all right. Um, what questions do you all have um, for the Roar team or for any of the featured integrators? I saw there were um, there was at least one question in the chat. I had a quick question for Tom. Um, for the example you showed of grabbing the publication metadata from Crossref, it's as I understood it, that's dependent on the publishers providing the lore IDs. So what do you do? You know, we know that this is an area where we're hoping to see more 
adoption and, and growth. And so I'm just wondering, you know, while we're waiting for more RUR IDs to be populated in Crossref metadata, do you have any other ways of identifying the Caltech affiliations in Crossref? Um, so yeah, at the moment, if it doesn't have a RUR, it comes in as, as free text if the publisher provides the affiliation at all. Um, a lot of times the publisher doesn't provide anything for the affiliation. Um, and there were, we currently basically, we manually map when a, when a record comes in. This only works because Caltech's small. Um, so we know, we generally know who the faculty members are. And then we use that autocomplete functionality to basically pull from our, our local, uh, you know, our local listing of people. And then th those include the roars. Um, so there's definitely more automation we can do about that mapping, but it is, it's really nice when the publishers just give it to us because then, then we know it's right and we don't have to mess with it. Thanks. Yeah, I think we would all be better off with more, <laughs> more of those IDs. Um, I have a, a question for Nina, actually. Um, I think I'm right in understanding that um, that edit feature you mentioned where someone can take a string and then look match that to a RAW ID is something that's available to editors. Um, I think you said it's also, submit, also available to su submitters, those who've uploaded the article. That's correct. Yeah. So we have, since we have, we are not only indexing, but we are hosting or publishing as well, journals, right. um, open access books, et cetera. Um, it's part of the submission. So if authors right. submit a manuscript that is um, available in this, um, in a similar interface, so they can do the same, basically. Mm -hmm. it's a, and on the book Meta Hub as well. So wherever we have an interface regarding metadata, um, there is part of the author information, are of course, the affiliations, part of the affiliations are the raw. Great. Same was true for the fund drive IDs. Yep. Same. And Stephanie, I think you had something to add. Hi, yeah, also from Science Open. Um, I just wanted to say as well, we, we do have some customers who we just do metadata, so help them to, um, enhance their cross-ref records and improve their cross-ref records. And we provide them a simple interface. Um, if they're really small, they're one journal publisher or just have a few journals. So in a couple of cases we do, and they have as well the same interface so they can easily go through, open the records and add um, uh, in you know 15 seconds, the the raw IDs. And we, we update that at cross-ref as well. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's also, just um, like Tom was saying, just getting at least something in uh, Crossref or um, even better getting raw IDs in Crossref is yeah, yeah. something that we also care about a lot because we would like to have more affiliation data searchable yeah. on our platform. <laughs> well, and one of the things that I find so interesting about that is that um, we have quite a bit of guidance for incorporating raw into submission forms so that the user can choose their organization and you know that it works that way in many systems. But I've seen um a couple of integrations like yours where in the production process an editor can then take a string and assign a raw id to it um, the one i'm thinking of in particular is the beilstein institute and I, I i really like that as a kind of an intermediate um step you know that that part of the work of editing is to yes fix things that are visible but maybe also you know really enhance what the author or contributor has submitted. So um, I've seen that in the Bioshine Institute and I think Rockefeller University Press also enables that to where production editors can improve the metadata. So I think that's great. Um, and I see Nick is asking in the chat whether Science Open has an API. I was just typing an answer, but I can just oh. say it. Uh, <laughs> we have an open API to the um, Book Meta Hub. We're working on one for um, Science Open in sort of smaller queries and stuff. But um, we can we can definitely have a chat and see if there's something we could do. Mm -hmm. 
We have one minute remaining. Um, would any of um, the integrators like to ask any of the other integrators any questions about, have you seen things that, um, that give you ideas or I have one super quick question. I love the project that Caltech is doing verifying this data. Is wouldn't this be an idea to have an a verified, you know, university partner feeding that kind of data back to Crossref so that other metadata people could use it as well? Cuz I I know we don't usually let other people, you know, um enhance metadata for other, you know, publishers records, but I'm just, you know, I just think that it this 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 uh we're and lots of people are doing the same thing over and over again and it just would be so brilliant if somebody like caltech could say hey these are all of our um publications adam yeah so i don't know about crossref because crossref has kind of an interesting position relative to enrichment of metadata and what we can do and what we can't do but i know that open alex is planning on doing something related to that where uh, users essentially will be able to go in and say this is associated with this or id or this is associated with this orchid id and then it will be populated in their database so i imagine that there's going to be room for that kind of work you know um, might not necessarily happen specifically in the crossref source data but it's definitely something to consider yeah, and I think Stephanie, um, it, it's it's a bit interesting because Crossref's um, historical position has been sort of that it's up to the publishers to provide good metadata, and that in fact, you know, again, as part of the publication process, that's part of what that's part of the value that publishers bring. Um, but it is it is difficult, and it's technically difficult. But I think that you know, for I think DataSite has a slightly different model where they really do work more closely with sort of individual institutions and with individual repositories. Um, and so Datasite and Crossref are both DOI registrars and, and specifically for sort of institutional repositories of the kind that Tom showed, it might be a bit easier to have that, those institutional identifiers, first of all. And then I think there is some kind of validation is perhaps not the, not quite the right word but you can you can literally search in the roar api where did this come from what client did this come from what institution did this come from and it seems to be um extremely reliable in some way um but you know that issue of you know crossref enhancing the metadata is a very interesting one because crossref itself does do that in very limited ways and is very much exploring the idea of doing a bit more of that than they have done historically Well, um, we're a bit over time. As I, as I say, I do have other questions. Thank you so much to our featured integrators um, for presenting. Um, we, you may join our Slack if you like. We also have a technical uh, discussion list uh, that you can join if we want to carry on these conversations. And we'll be releasing the recording uh, and the slides this week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you.